For those of you who don't know, my name is Brian Arrigo. I'm the mayor of the city of Revere. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, we wanted to try to get on, uh, we're a little bit late, but we wanted to get going because uh, we, I heard that there's a sporting event later tonight that people may be running out the door to go check out. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, I started off uh, a conversation with our advisory group uh, a couple of months ago and I said, welcome to history. Uh, it has uh, been a, uh, an honor to be part of uh, what is happening at Suffolk Downs. Uh, and so uh, to get to this point and have us now talking uh, a little bit more publicly and getting ready, gearing up to go to the city council is, uh, is really an exciting uh, prospect. Uh, I especially want to thank the folks who took the time out of their lives to be part of the advisory group. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the development advisory group that I'm talking about uh, was part of the city council's approval of an overlay district. And so uh, that group was formed by myself and uh, we had about 25 people who took an awful lot of time out of their lives to uh, devote to the details of this project. And there are a lot of details to, to a project of this magnitude. Uh, so the fact that we have folks from a cross-section of our community, from education to nonprofits to uh, the city council who are willing to dive in kind of each, uh, on each detail uh, really speaks to the strength of, of our community and the strength of this process, which has been uh, really transparent. Uh, lastly, I want to thank uh, Tom and his team, HYM, uh, for the incredible work that they've done uh, in being willing to, to go through a public process like this and being willing to uh, engage with the city, with stakeholders. I think they're probably up to two or three hundred meetings by now, maybe four or three hundred meetings, three, over three hundred meetings, which is really incredible. Uh, but that uh, really shows, uh, I think, their diligence, but also the importance of, of a project like this. Uh, this is going to set the course for our city uh, for decades to come. Uh, with all that said, I'm going to uh, quickly go through our agenda. Uh, so we're going to have uh, our Director of Economic Development, Bob O'Brien, come and talk a little bit, of, uh, give a little bit of the background of the permitting process. Uh, and then uh, Tom and Doug will be giving a presentation. It might be just Tom, but uh, we'll be giving a presentation. And then we'll be talking uh, next steps with uh, Bob O'Brien again. Uh, I, I, I have heard that Tom would r rather have questions as we go through, th uh, through things, but he's going to try to parcel things out so that uh, if you have a traffic question, there'll be a traffic section that, that he can address those questions at. But without further ado, I want to uh, uh, ask uh, Bob O'Brien to come up and uh, give his uh, few minutes to Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just first of all want to reiterate uh, the mayor's compliments to the quality and dedication of the development advisory group. It's been my honor to moderate that group, but they are an extremely dedicated, well-informed group, many of whom are in the room today, all of whom are named on the opposite side of your agenda. Uh, likewise, the peer review group, which has supported our efforts from a prof professional capacity, all of whom have made this a very, a very transparent, as the mayor said, but also professional process. I'll be very brief because the point of today is to get to the presentation, but just to put this in context in terms of the planning and permitting process overall. Um, that process actually began soon after and arguably somewhat before uh, HYM Investment Group bought uh, Suffolk Downs, uh, and we were gearing up for planning for a new zoning district uh, through the summer when we were interrupted by the Amazon RFP, which distracted us for a bit, but in a sense accelerated the process. That came out in September. We responded in a collaborative effort with the city of Boston and the HYM development group in October. Once that was completed, we returned our attention, the city, 
and the developer to the zoning overlay district. That was finally approved by the city council in March of uh, this year, and uh, it was a lengthy document that set out the parameters for development of Suffolk Downs, but there were three or four points that are worth noting. One was there was an unequivocal commitment in that um, overlay district to making 25% of the Suffolk Downs development publicly accessible open space. That's equally true of both the Boston and Revere components. Um, secondly, especially important from the point of view of Revere, there was a commitment by the developer to have at least 50% of the developable space developed in the city of Revere be devoted to commercial rather than residential purposes. Third, they made a commitment uh, to engaging in the next phase of the process through the planned unit development mechanism, which is a well-established procedure in the city of Revere. And finally, they committed to community involvement in that process uh, through the development advisory group. Um, soon after the um, zoning overlay district was approved, the development advisory group was appointed by the mayor and we began meeting in June of this year. Uh, we met on seven different occasions uh, in working sessions that were open to the public, broadcast on Revere TV, documented in our website, the presentations for which were also shown on the HYM website and all of which is currently available. Each of those meetings was devoted to a substantive issue that needed to be addressed in the planned unit development document, whether it was architecture and urban design or traffic and transportation or infrastructure and resiliency or a whole series of issues which Tom will review. Out of that came uh, the review and refinement of the planned unit development document and the synthesis of that uh, document which will be presented here today. As the mayor has suggested, I think the presentation will speak for itself, but we are talking about a truly transformative development, not just for Suffolk Downs as a whole, but for Revere in particular. And I think it's a tribute not only to the public process and the development advisory group, the peer review group and others, but uh, notably to the leadership of the mayor and the responsiveness of the HYM development group. And I think that's all the introduction that is required uh, before I bring to the fore um, the managing director of the HYM investment group, the developer and owner of Suffolk Downs, who will be coordinating the presentation and the uh, dialogue here tonight. Tom O'Brien. Um, I'm going to use this microphone. This is a compact enough room where you know you maybe don't need it, but I think um, for the purposes of Revere TV, we need it, you know, going. So um, I would just say, just at the outset, uh, Bob also has a microphone. So if people have questions, it would be great if you if you have a question on transportation, for example, there there is a section on transportation. So if you have a question, if you could ask it during that section, that would be great. But honestly, I'm happy to take any questions you might have at any you know point in time. If I could just at the outset repeat just a couple of quick things. The first is I want to thank the mayor, Mayor Arrigo, for uh, all the great work that, um, that you've done to help us uh, get to this point, to help us organize things and, and, and conduct this process along with Bob and Frank and the entire team of, of people uh, that are on the mayor's staff who've been working uh, with us on, on this, uh, this process all the way through. I want to thank all the members of the DAG, the Development Advisory Group, who are scattered through the audience. Uh, this requires a lot of commitment from people. They're, you're, uh, you're all volunteers and civic leaders, and, and um, we really appreciate the work that everybody's done. I was actually just sitting here thinking during the mayor's remarks, I've been doing this for more than 25 years, and this is one of the most professional processes that I've ever been involved in. It's really been terrific. And I, I think the size of this project and the, uh, the scope of it and the fact that it's going to, um, we think, be so transformative for this site um, probably warranted a process that was well conducted and, and, uh, and professionally run in the way that it has been. So it's been an honor for us to be part of it. So, so thank you very much. So if I could, there's, there's kind of two sets of audience members here, if I, if I can. The first are, there are DAG members here. Um, I wonder if, actually, if I could ask a DAG, all the DAG members to just raise their hands so just so we can identify everybody who's here, okay? 
So there are DAG members. Now, for the other members of the audience, we've been together frequently, right, since June, as, as Bob said. So for DAG members, a lot of what I'm going to go about uh, talking about tonight, the GA DAG members know well. Um, they may have other questions or more detailed things. But so, so for DAG members, I'm going to go over a lot of material that you've already seen, right? So may, perhaps the audience is a little bit more focused on people who have not been at meetings. And so it will be a little bit from the beginning and sort of how we get to this, you know, this point, if I, if I could. So I'm also acutely aware that there's a baseball game tonight. So I'm going to try and move at a good pace and see if we can get through uh, this. I want to get everybody out the door, certainly by quarter of eight, if we can. Okay? So um, first, the site. Um, Remember, and I think everybody knows this, it's a huge site for us, for developers. It's 161 acres, which is a very, very big site. There are a couple of things to just note. One, our front door, our front doors, two front doors, are the two T-stations, Suffolk Downs, uh, but certainly the front door in Revere is the Beachmont T-station. Um, so our plan, basically, is to build out from these T-stations and to encourage the fact that this is a what we call a transit-oriented development site, so TO, TOD site. That's really the way we think of this. Um, those T stations are really important to the overall development, but in addition to that, there are other really interesting, um, uh, you know, kind of key pieces here. First is we're close to downtown Boston, as you well know. I mean, we're 12 minutes by Blue Line uh, T uh, to downtown Boston. We're close by some great natural assets, from Belle Isle Marsh to Constitution Beach to Revere Beach, some great uh, natural assets that are uh, that will add to making this a great place for people to both live and work uh, over a period of time. Um, a little bit on just schedule of kind of where we've been. Um, my partner, Doug Manns, unfortunately had a school event tonight for his uh, two of his kids, and so he couldn't be here with me, but, but Doug and I have been uh, tied together uh, on projects like this for a long time. So our, our company, the HYM Investment Group, if I could just add a, a minute on it, um, we, we work on some of the largest, most complicated projects like this in the region. So we're the people who have been working with New Balance on the New Balance campus on the Mass Pike. We, uh, we are, have been their development partners for the development of the New Bruins practice facility there, the office buildings, the, uh, the residential buildings that have been there. We're the people who took on a site that was known as North Point in, uh, in Cambridge. So we took that project on to straighten that out. That was the former rail yards that are between Cambridge and, and Charlestown. We took that on, built a couple of buildings, built some of the parks. Uh, we've since sold our interest to another company called Divco West, uh, but we set that on a good path uh, to move forward. If you drive by there today, you see a number of buildings that are underway. Um, we also were the people who worked on Waterside Place, which is one of the first residential buildings to be built in the seaport under uh, since the, the recession of 2009, 2010. And we're also the redevelopers of the Government Center Garage, which is the the big ugly garage in downtown Boston right near um, City Hall and, and TD Garden. So we're used to taking on big complicated projects like this. This is kind of what we do. For Doug and I, my partner, we, we started on this process really in the fall of 2016. So we've been doing this for two years. We had a handshake to kind of purchase the property in that period of time, 2016. We actually closed on the acquisition, as Bob said, in May of 2017. We engaged in an affirmative process with the mayor, with uh, city councilors, with all the rest of it. So we've been doing this outreach and this community engagement process for at least 18 months. And, and as the mayor said, we've been, I think this is like our 325th meeting or 330th meeting or so that we've been doing since then. Um, obviously, it's, it's something that we enjoy doing. It's, you know, it's this kind of community work is sort of, uh, is kind of what we're all about. The horse racing, as people may know, has continued through this period of time. Uh, we will have our last two horse racing dates in the spring of 2019, and then the horse racing will, will end. We own the site, um, but the horse racing has been a continued activity. They leased the old property, the old owners of the site leased the site from us to run the horse racing, and then the horse racing will stop. Um, and obviously, as we say, we've been engaged in these community meetings. From the beginning, we, we knew it was imperative to put together a great group of professionals to uh, work on this project. It's a big, complicated site. It's got long phase development. We wanted to make sure that we got the best professionals involved. So that's us up on top, the HYM Investment Group. We have a, a group of investors who are with us to, uh, who are part of this, who are part of this ownership group with us. But in addition to that, CBT is our master planner and our architect. Stas is the landscape architect for us. So they not only think about the landscaping, but they also have a really uh, great amount of expertise around dealing with climate change related issues and, uh, uh, and resiliency. P3 
PCA is our retail architect, VHB is our permitting and traffic consultant. To the extent that you have traffic uh, uh, questions uh, tonight, I'm joined by John Kennedy. John, raise, raise your hand. John, who's a longtime uh, traffic and transportation engineer who's worked on, I'd say, every major project in the greater Boston area for, I won't say how many decades, but an, a, long, a long time. Um, so, and a, a great friend and a terrific advisor, great expert on that. Beals and Thomas, Arup has been our sustainability consultant. This just gives you a list of the different meetings that we've been involved in. We've done a bunch uh, from you know, community meetings to staff meetings to neighborhood groups. And by the way, remember, 60% of our site is in East Boston, so we've been doing a similar kind of community engagement process in East Boston as well. So first to the site, just some pieces that, that uh, many people will, will recognize. This slide is meant to suggest to you that the red hatched area, so the area that's kind of uh, colored in here with the red hatching, that area has been separated from the public for the entire 80 years that, you know, that this has been a horse racing track. Meaning that, the, you know, while it might be possible for you to look at the, uh, the, you know, the, the green grass in the middle of the racetrack, you, nobody's ever walked on it. Nobody's ever been on it. And there's never really been any public access, certainly into the horse barns or all those pieces that are here on the Beachmont side of the site. So our objective, our base objective, is to open the site up and to connect it, reconnect it into the surrounding neighborhoods and take advantage of some of the really interesting natural assets. So these are pictures that we took. These are existing wetlands from Sales Creek to the existing pond on the other side. It's beautiful when you walk the, um, uh, you know, particularly the, the main green that's on the, in the middle of the track. It's a terrific spot. So what's our development vision? What do we want to do? Our vision is to create, in this upper left-hand corner, a mixed-use walkable neighborhood. So what that means is we want to make this a place where people will both live and work and that there will be retail there, restaurants, not big box retail, but restaurants and things like that. We want to make it a place that people will want to live and work. That's a, that's a key thing for us. So when we say this, oftentimes people will say, okay, what's the, is there a precedent? Is there an example that we can point to? And so for us, oftentimes we look at, we, we'll point to Assembly Row and kind of what's happened at Assembly Row. Uh, to a certain extent, the, the marketplace that has been built in Linfield, you know, that, that sort of, of um, uh, vision of retail, that sort of vision of a place that can be both a place for living and working, that's the sort of thing that we're thinking about. We think we're more talented than some of the developers that have done those projects, so hopefully we're going to hit some goals and make some, uh, you know, some pieces work a little bit better. Um, but generally, that's the idea of what we're trying to do. We start with open space and parks, and that'll be the, the key part of our, our presentation here tonight. Um, we've decided right from the very beginning that we would devote 25% of the site to open space and parks. So that'll be, uh, that's kind of the, the basic building block for us as we go through. I talked about retail. Again, it's neighborhood retail, not big box retail, not, uh, not a, a Target store, not, you know, those sorts of things, but restaurants, great food places, interesting spots. We're hopeful that we can take the lack of that sort of retail that uh, perhaps exists today in Revere and add to it and make this a great destination for all of you to be part of this. this is, we want this to be a very public place um, and a place that you know, is, a, uh, is an interesting place to visit as well as to live and to work. In addition to that, if we set the table right by making it a mixed-use walkable neighborhood, by doing the open space correctly, by adding the neighborhood retail, then we think we can lure companies and create economic development. So working with the mayor and Bob and his team as well as all the members of the city council, we've also uh, focused on the fact that for the first time we're going to uh, work very hard to build commercial office buildings in Revere on a you know, grand scale. That's a really important piece. It helps Revere from a fiscal perspective in terms of the tax revenue from that. It also helps create jobs, obviously. So that's a, a key part of it. The, the most important thing, though, is to set the table correctly first by making it a place to live and work first, retail, all those things. Then we'll get the companies that will help us build those office uh, buildings. Uh, tr it's a transit-oriented development site, as you, as you note, because we're right on the blue line. I'm going to talk about resiliency and sustainability on, on the site. So first, beginning with the open space framework. So it's 40 acres of open space. So here you can see across the site, what we're trying to do is create a framework for the open space that works throughout the site, so that there are central pieces, but also great places for people to gather outside of the central framework for open space. We want the character of the open space to be, uh, to, to be variable. In other words, there might be some people who want to go read a book. There might be some people who want to go exercise or go for a run. And so they, across the open space, there'll be a variety of different types of character that we'll want to bring to it. Um, these are uh, just you know, precedent images of the kinds of things that we're thinking about, from green fingers that stretch the park system into the back portions of the site to the central common that will be more of a gathering spot for people. 
um, active linear parks that offer opportunities for people to go for a run or a walk. We'll have a loop on the site just to show you how big the, uh, uh, you can go out that door, Michael, and come back in this one. The, um, just to show you uh, how big the site is, there's a loop that will exist on this uh, site that will be about 1.5 uh, miles for people to do a run or a walk. It's going to be really uh, fascinating. We'll have uh, opportunities to preserve some of the historic elements that have existed there uh, and, and chances for public art as well, which is, uh, which is also great. So this is a slide we, we put in. We've had a number of really good engagements uh, back and forth with members of the DAG, and this kind of adds some, some of the key suggested elements that were kind of on our mind a little bit, that we kind of tested a little bit and got positive feedback from the DAG. But generally, obviously, what we're, we're after here are walkable, bikeable neighborhoods, uh, particularly making, you know, taking advantage of the 40-acre open space network but we want there to be both, as I've said, active and passive recreation op options. Uh, you can see us doing on-site groceries, so smaller groceries, not a, a big, huge grocery, but uh, smaller groceries uh, and specialty stores, pharmacies. We want to have local produce uh, kind of farmer's markets. So you know, we have a good relationship with the existing um, uh, uh, public market that exists in downtown Boston, taking that kind of a model and create farmer's markets that might be uh, kind of festival in the way that they uh, you know, uh, present themselves active social spaces, cultural festivals. There's chances for us right from the get-go, since we're one owner, to do some interesting things around programming to make the whole site kind of come alive. Certainly community-selected public art, that would be awesome for us if we could work together with the mayor's office and with members of the DAG and other folks you know, who uh, know of uh, existing artists in Revere or existing ideas for community art. If there's student-driven pieces, it would be terrific for us to kind of think all those pieces through. So those are you know, just ideas of it. This is generally a piece of the open space, so this is an outdoor theater. This, is, this would be in Revere, near Sales Creek, uh, just off of where we're uh, uh, planning for our phase one piece of it. Uh, I'm going to come back to this a little bit later because it doubles as a way that we'll manage the potential of flood water in the future as we go through the sustainability questions. This is a civic plaza on the other side of the site, again with some public building opportunities for music, opportunities for there to be daycare, things like that. So the master plan vision then becomes this. So as you can see here, what we're trying to do is, is integrate the open space throughout the entire site, create opportunities for there to be kind of smaller blocks, for it to be a walkable site, a great place, as we say, for people to work and to live. Um, this is the Revere portion of that master plan. So remember, let me just outline this. So the border, kind of hard to see, but this dotted line that runs here along Sales Creek and then kind of makes a left here towards the north side of the site <clears throat> and then makes another left kind of heading a little bit more northwest and comes this way along the border of the oil tanks and comes all the way up here to 1A. So everything that is inside of here is in Boston. <clears throat> everything that's in here is in Revere. So it's about 40% of the site or so is in Revere. So this is the Revere piece of it. As you can see, very you know, similar aspirations in terms of the park and all the, you know, what we're thinking about in terms of the buildings. So all those pieces. This is the, the basic land use here. So the blue buildings here are commercial buildings. The orange piece here is a hotel here and another hotel here, a little deeper into the site. Uh, there's retail throughout uh, this whole stretch. Uh, and then these darker yellow are what we call mixed use uh, buildings. So these are retail on the first floor with residential above. And then these are smaller residential uh, buildings here. Because they're off of the main street, I'm gonna talk about the retail in one second. Because they're off of the main street, we think you know there might be some retail here, but it's not the central retail that we're thinking on the main street, which I'm going to show you in, in one second. So that's the basic plan for, uh, for Revere. Um, this is the program for Revere. So these are the actual numbers. And I, and I would say, by the way, people uh, can, if people want us to email this to them or they want a printed copy of this, we're more than happy to get this into your hands so that people can look at it. And it will also be posted on our website, uh, the HYM Investment Group uh, website, uh, in addition, we have a specific website for the redevelopment of Suffolk Downs, so we'll make all that clear to you at the end so you can download this if you want. So the basic program in Revere is 50% is of the site must be dedicated to uh, commercial, meaning the office piece, the retail, and the hotel. So the commercial is 2.84 million square feet in Revere. There's, been, there's never been a proposal like this in the history of Revere in terms of adding this much commercial space uh, to Revere. So we're really excited to be part of it. It's a big honor to be working with the mayor and everybody else to add this much commercial space to, uh, uh, to Revere. It will make a huge difference in the fiscal situation in Revere. And then the residential piece is the remaining 50%, 2.84 million square feet. This is all phased, so it will take us probably 15 to 20 years or so to build, us, you know, build this, this site out. So these pieces do not happen tomorrow. These are all uh, phased in over a period of time. 
The overall master plan, remember the Boston side, uh, is reflective of that. Boston is more interested in having more housing units, relatively you know, speaking. So there's a little bit more housing in the Boston side than there is the commercial. But Revere uh, you know, was very adamant about it, and we worked very closely with the mayor, and we're happy to, to, uh, to propose it in this way. This is the on-site street network. So remember, we need to build all of the streets, all the water and the sewer, all those pieces we, you know, that's on us. Uh, we went into it knowing that that would be what we would want to do. So these are all uh, the streets that we would have to uh, create, some of which are uh, kind of uh, streets that will move a little bit more traffic uh, around the site. Some are a little bit smaller kind of neighborhood streets as we go through. So it's kind of the hierarchy of streets as we think it through. Um, there will be uh, bike lanes throughout the site, so we'll probably do about four miles or so, or 17,000 linear feet of on-site bike lanes, uh, all kinds of different uh, types of bike lanes. So some will be cycle track, some will be uh, a little bit more neighborhood oriented, but, but generally there'll be bike lanes throughout the entire site, uh, about four miles of it, as I say. Pedestrian network, basically we want it to be a very pedestrian friendly site. So pedestrians everywhere on the site, and the network really is extensive with protected opportunities for pedestrians to walk through the site. These are those loops that I described before, so uh, there's an opportunity for about a 1.4 mile loop, or if you do the complete outside of the site, about a two mile loop to uh, do a run or a walk uh, throughout the site. So it really shows you how big the, the site is to be able to do uh, these loops. We think that there, because the site's so big, there's, there's probably about four or so distinctive neighborhoods from Beachmont here to a central neighborhood here that probably has a sort of a commercial feel to it. This uh, neighborhood by the Suffolk Downs T-stop We've taken to call the Belle Isle Mar or Belle Isle Square neighborhood, um, which is generally a take on the Belle Isle Marsh piece, obviously. Um, and then this neighborhood here is a little bit more associated associated with Bell, uh, with Waldemar Ave on, on East Boston, so it's a uh, has a little different character as well. Um, so for the office piece, which is a, a tremendous focus for us, particularly in Revere, um, you know, remember that it's, it's about two and a half million square feet of of office and potential lab. So the lab piece, remember. Lab for us, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a tremendous part and growing part of the, uh, of the greater Boston economy. It's centered around Kendall Square and Cambridge right now. But the lab business and the uh, life science business has become a huge uh, part of the overall economy in, in, uh, in Boston and Cambridge. And so we think that, and we know this market, we know these people, they're looking for campus-like locations. So uh, we think this is an obvious campus-like location. We're working closely with the mayor's office and, and other folks to make sure that we make a good connection between the blue line and the red line, which connects people to, uh, to Kendall Square. But we think this could be a great destination for those sorts of companies. So those companies are the traditional pharmaceutical companies that you think about, and they, uh, they run uh, research protocols into neurological uh, diseases, heart diseases, things like that, cancer. Uh, and Boston and Cambridge have become a center for that work. So that's what we mean when we say lab. Um, generally, this gives you a sense of you know, kind of what's happening with that. The nature of work has become more collaborative. People want more open uh, floor plates within their office space. They're used to, or they want to be located in campuses that are maybe outside of the traditional spaces around the downtown core. So these are just giving you images of, you know, kind of uh, uh, different workspaces like that. This is an innovation center. So <clears throat> this is something that we worked very closely again with the mayor to try and um, uh, kind of think through and, and conceptualize. And this will be a piece that we'll deliver in the first phase. So. This is a, a space located here, about 35,000 square feet, on the plaza right outside of Beachmont Station. This is something that uh, we think is similar to the innovation uh, uh, hall that's in uh, the Seaport District that you might know. That building you know, was built in an early phase and really set the table for the, um, the effort in the Seaport to build out commercial and attract new commercial tenants. So we think of this as a, a place that can offer innovation uh, leaders and people a nice opportunity to start new companies, to meet, so uh, this is a, a first phase building that we've committed to that we're really excited about uh, putting together. Um, this gives you a sense of what Beachmont Square would look like. So that's that innovation. Uh, this is the sorry. This is that innovation building here, and then here in the in the plan here. This just gives you a sense of that building here on the left. You're standing kind of in the middle of Beachmont Square, looking back toward Beachmont T Station. So you're looking south uh, here. So this is, you know, uh, uh, the feel of what we want to have happen at, at Beachmont Square. Um, this gives you a sense generally of what this innovation center can look like. It can also double as a gathering spot for community meetings as well. So if the Beachmont Improvement Association or if the city has meetings, this space can house those meetings as well. Neighborhood retail. So what do we mean by neighborhood retail? So first, we want to create kind of a main street. So this, this walk from Beachmont Station through the site all the way to Suffolk Downs is a little over a mile, so it's a it's a it's a real walk, 
But we want to make sure that that's a kind of a main street walk with retail on both sides of it. And the retail, again, is not big box. We want it to be restaurant type. Uh, and we begin right here in the first phase with retail right at that, at that plaza. So this kind of Beachmont Square Plaza or Beachmont Plaza, we want to really come off well, particularly in the first phase. We need that first phase to be a place that people really feel comfortable, very public. We want it to be a place that you know, offers restaurants with really interesting meals. We want it to be a great place that kind of gets some buzz associated with it. So this, this first phase, these retail pieces here are really important to us to get those right, right out of the gate. But then extending that <clears throat> along the main street here, all the way, <clears throat> excuse me, to the Suffolk Downs Tea Station is a key part of what we're all about. <clears throat> excuse me. So over 500,000 square feet of diverse, uh, you know, kind of street front retail will be built all along that stretch and all throughout the site. Um, about 10% of that, we've also committed to local business owners. So we've already started to kind of conceptualize and think through, are there local business owners that we can help uh, offer lower cost options to be on our site? We want the retail to be unique. We don't want it to just be national chain. So uh, think about local restaurant operators. You know, we, we need it to be successful. So we don't want to put people in a position where they're not going to be successful. But we definitely want you know, to, to think through and, and, uh, and work with local business owners. So the idea is to have restaurants, small grocery stores, pharmacies, coffee shops, craft brewery, wine bars, bookstores, specialty stores, hardware, banks, all these different pieces, daycare, specialty foods, you know, all those, all those things. I'm a terrible bowler, so I don't think we'll have bowling there. But, they, but all these different uh, pieces you know, is kind of what we're thinking about. We want it to be a real community. And in the square, again, coming back to the programming, having festivals and opportunities for there to be you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday farmers markets, things like that. Um, that's the programming of it kind of brings people to the site. So these, this gives you a sense of those sort of civic plaza precedents that we're trying to uh, bring to bear on the site. Uh, food trucks, you know, using food trucks in a way, particularly in the early days, to generate excitement around it. This gives you a sense of what that Main Street Retail District, you know, can look like. Hotel. <clears throat> so the hotel market is really strong right now. So remember, we're planning in the first phase a hotel right here. The hotel market's really strong. In fact, I think there's two or three hotels that are underway right now in Revere, which is a credit to the mayor's administration and, and, uh, and everybody who's working on these things. For us, we have a, a, a vision for a hotel that we, you know, that we really want to stick to, which is we don't want our, the hotel here on this site to just be a hotel for airport travelers and things like that. We want this hotel to be a, kind of a community builder for us. So we need it to be a special hotel that has a great restaurant, perhaps has a, a rooftop restaurant that we think will have water views, rooftop bar on there. So we need it to be kind of a destination that is a community builder for us, not just a place that people stay in and, you know, because uh, it's close to the airport. Um, so this kind of gives you some precedent images of what we're starting to think about. This is actually the Envoy Hotel in Boston. Uh, this is a, another hotel uh, in, uh, on D Street in Boston. So these are, these are not kind of, you know, particularly this D Street Hotel, these are not in central location, so, but it gives you a sense of what you can do if you stick to your guns in terms of design and, and making sure that the hotel is, is special. So our, we've already begun the work necessary to plan this out, to think about, you know, what the financial implications of it are but we want the hotel to be special. Housing, <clears throat> and I know this is an important issue uh, in Revere. So um, we, you know, from the get-go have said that one of the most important things is you need to make it a great place to live. We, um, you know, Revere uh, does not have um, a significant amount of commercial office space, uh, primarily because commercial office tenants don't often think to locate in Revere because there's not really a campus, there's not really, you know, the opportunity to have the restaurant and the, sort of the, all the other things that we've talked about, the restaurant mix. So really the first thing we need to do is make it a great place for people to live, add the restaurants, make all those pieces happen so it's kind of a, you know, a good momentum going. Then we know we can make the, um, uh, the office piece work. But the residential needs to be kind of a mix of units. So this is a, a key slide. So um, we're gonna do uh, senior housing units. 10% of all of our units will be for seniors on site. So we want it to be a true community. So we will have uh, senior housing units that will have a variety of different sizes from studios to two bedrooms. We'll offer condos, so opportunities for uh, purchase, homes for purchase on the site will be an important part of what we'll offer. And we'll also do apartments as well. Um, we will not have three bedroom apartments. You know, there's a variety of things that we've dealt with with the DAG. I'm happy to answer questions to the, to the extent people have details on it. But again, what we're trying to do is, is add a variety of housing units to make this uh, a real, a true community of, uh, of, of a variety of different types of people. These are residential precedents. These are a couple of buildings actually that we've already developed are some of them, these, these two pieces on the left here. So we want these to be uh, residential buildings that 
you know, are really going to stand the test of time, that they're well built, they're well structured, they're carefully thought out uh, with amenity uh, uh, pieces in the building that, you know, make them uh, compete well with, with uh, other areas of, of the greater Boston region as well. Uh, street and garage parking. So this is an important piece I know of, uh, on people's minds. Uh, there will be street parking. Um, so we will have, you know, we, we are going to build the streets, um, but also that means we're going to maintain the streets as well. So there will be street parking. Uh, but each of the buildings that we'll build will have uh, on-site um, garage parking as well. So in general, all people who, you know, live on the site, all people who work on the site will park on the site. We also want to offer opportunities for visitors, particularly for the retail, obviously, to park on the site as well. So um, we, are, we want to build enough parking. We don't want to build too much parking because parking is not really, uh, it's not a, a business. You do, you do, the, the parking doesn't pay. If you build parking today, it's too expensive to build and the money that you get from it is not a good business. So um, we don't want to overbuild the parking, but we make, want to make sure we build enough parking. So essentially this gives you a sense of what the, the ratios are for us across the board. Excuse me. Um, so for studio, you know, and residential across the board, it's for the most part, um, these are, you know, one space per unit across the, um, uh, the residential piece. Two bedrooms, again, one space probably f uh, per bedroom. For the commercial, about one per thousand is about where the market is for, uh, for commercial office. Hotels, you need less uh, uh, parking, so about uh, 0.5 spaces per key or per room. Uh, one per 500 square feet of the retail and one per eight, eight seats on the restaurant. In our experience, this is you know more than enough parking to make it work, particularly given the 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 uh, general um, uh, you know kind of uh, downward trend on uh, car usage and, and uh, you know people wanting to use public transportation or other means of getting to uh, their their destination. Um, the parking location. So as I said, um, each building will have parking, but these are these red marks here are on street parking locations as well. So these would be uh, on street location. We, we we want the parking, remember, we're going to manage the parking to be sure that we are not getting commuters. We do not want commuters on this site. We want this to be a special site. So we only, the, the parkers that we want are people who are coming to use the retail, or people who live there, or people who work there, or people who are visiting. We don't want commuters coming here and using the blue line from here. That's a key part of what we're all about. So we'll manage the parking, obviously, with that in mind, and the way we price it, and the way we think it through, and the, the nature of the, the term that people can use for a parking on site. So community benefits. We, you know, we, Obviously, this is a, a big undertaking for us. Um, we think that there are some significant benefits, obviously, to the community. The first is, is, is tax revenue. So we're taking, remember, a site that has horse barns on it today, that has, a, you know, unfortunately, a, a declining um, uh, horse racing business, and we're going to turn that site into uh, something that will produce taxes for the community. The total revenue that we project um, is about $43 million um, uh, in, in terms of tax revenue. That, I think... I think that doubles the, the property tax um, base in, in Revere. I, I, I'm pretty sure that that's where it takes it, you know, um, as I look at it. Um, we've also done a study working closely with the mayor and, and Bob to be sure that we've adequately thought through what the potential expenses are if we add this amount of development. What does that mean in terms of uh, additions to the police force, additions to the uh, fire department, other things that we need to think about. And so we went through and created a what we think is an appropriate <clears throat> but relatively conservative um, you know, group of expenses around that. So the net benefit to the city is about $30 million. Uh, and just the phase one piece, the net benefit is about $5.5 million. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one of the biggest, I think, uh, contributions to the Revere, uh, uh, you know, coffers that, that, uh, that has ever been made. So generally what that translates into is future bonding capacity of, you know, well over $400 million. So it's, it's really, uh, that's a key community benefit. Um, in addition to that, we will construct all of these parks. We'll make sure all these pieces, and these are all public. So anybody can, you can walk there, you can ride your bike there, you can drive and park and, and walk, uh, but this is all public. We, we, we will own it and maintain it to be sure that it's maintained to a high level of quality and it doesn't add to the burden of uh, owning and maintaining open space for the city. So we will maintain that, but it is absolutely uh, public uh, in the way that we, um, uh, we run it. We run, we'll, We'll build all the street network, so we'll do all this together with all the water and sewer. We build that and we'll maintain this as well. So this too will not be a burden um, for the city. Public works piece, we spent a lot of time with the public works department and, as well as the Mass Water Resources Authority and others. So we have a, a plan for how we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll add to and create all of the uh, under roadway utilities. And again, we maintain that, that's our, that's our piece. Uh, all the water capacity, all these pieces, these are all things that we will do. Um, so again, transit-oriented development, a little bit on transportation. I just wanted to add this. Um, 
think we're coming to the end. I forget, Kate, how many slides we have. Um, but the um, uh, but generally, just a little bit on transportation. We in our filing, we we made a, a draft project impact uh, report filing two Mondays ago, I think it is, <clears throat> and it's one of the most extensive transportation studies I think that certainly I've ever been part of, and I, I think that uh, any developer in the region has, has been part of. So essentially, um, we went through a study of the existing blue line and bus transit systems. We also examined over 53 intersections all around the, the region, all around our site. Existing, we, we, we studied existing deficient intersect, intersection conditions. You know these intersections, so we're basically studying intersections that aren't working today. Um, we looked at the, there's an existing 450 car queue, particularly in the morning on Route 1A. We looked at all those pieces. Um, we added into our traffic study about three million square feet of other projects, so what we call background growth. So in addition to our project, we've taken responsibility in our study for all the other projected development that might happen around the area. So we're not just studying this in a vacuum. Um, and then we projected that over 20 years uh, for background growth. And we looked at you know vehicle, uh, vehicle trips from our complete master plan project. So in other words, looking all the way to 2038, the completion of our project, and we figured in all the potential uh, projected vehicle trips from there. So essentially, <clears throat> where we are, we've, we've planned, let me just get kind of get to the, the bottom line. We've planned over $300 million, $300 million of uh, infrastructure improvements, both on-site and off-site, to manage traffic, the open space, all the different pieces that I just described. Of that $300 million, about $50 million of it is to be spent off of our site on transportation improvements and things that uh, certainly you know, we affect, um, but are not directly related only to us. So uh, the improvements on Route 1A, for example, that I'll talk about, improvements on the intersections around uh, Winthrop Ave and all those pieces, improvements to Bell Circle, all those things, those are all off-site for which we have plans uh, and which we you know, project to pay for, but they are uh, not directly on our site. So generally, you know, we've gone through Blue Line, uh, studied the most congested segment, which is, as you know, Maverick to Aquarium. Everybody here, if you get on at Wonderland, if you get on at Beachmont, you have a seat, but obviously you know it probably it fills up when you get to Maverick. Um, generally, the blue line is below um, uh, policy capacity and certainly well below uh, crush capacity, which is an interesting term that the MBTA uses to measure how many people uh, are on a train. Um, almost 50% of the ridership that, we're, that will hen end up from our proposal will be coming in a reverse commute. So interesting, if you think about it, the blue line is one of the few lines in the system that essentially is in one direct, people are going in one direction. So people commute in the morning and people commute back out at, at night, as opposed to the red line and the orange line where people are going in different directions from, you know, from, from the different stops. When we put commercial office space on our site, people are coming to our site, which, is a, which takes the empty trains that are coming back out of the city of Boston in the morning and fills them with riders. So it brings new revenue to the MBTA that they, hadn't otherwise, they wouldn't otherwise have. Um, so uh, we'll add material new revenue, about $7 million, I think, uh, annually to the MBTA system. And there is sufficient uh, platform capacity, we've studied all this, uh, to, uh, to deal with all the, the new riders that we're proposing over time. So as I said, about $50 million of off-site traffic mitigation measures are proposed. Improvements to about 30 intersections, which include the 1A corridor, I think I have a couple slides to just show you a few of these things. The 1A corridor between Boardman and Winthrop Avenue, Winthrop Avenue from uh, Route 1A to Bennington, all the way down past our site, uh, Beachmont Square, uh, Route 1 and Route 16, all those improvements are meant to maintain or enhance. So essentially after we, we make these improvements and we add all the people from the new development, we take um, many of the intersections that are currently failing, that have an F, and improve them up the score to either a D or a C. Now I know that doesn't sound like a straight A student, but in an urban environment to take an F intersection and make it a D or a C is a huge win um, and, a, and, a, and a big change I think in people's lives, which, is, which we're uh, pleased about. Um, <clears throat> there are, on, obviously I, I talked about this on the on-site, you know, we've got shuttle buses that we're going to run on site to encourage people to use the blue line, all the different pieces on, on uh, bike stations. I think I went through some of this stuff. Um, let me just a couple of quick slides. There are, you know, we obviously studied these existing transit services. These are pieces that you know well from, from bus routes to uh, the blue line. Um, we looked carefully at the walk routes. So to make sure that we're, when we build the site, we're creating the proper encouragement for people to walk on our site to the blue line. Uh, and from these, we made assumptions around adding on-site shuttles for people. So we'll run a bus shuttle to make sure that if somebody lives here or works here, they're not um, somehow driving to the T-Station. They're, 
or deciding that they're going to, it's easier for them to take an Uber in on 1A. We want them to be encouraged to take the Blue Line station. So we'll do on-site uh, shuttles. And that's what this shows is these are shuttle uh, loops on the site that will run. So vans that will bring people to the Blue Line stations. These are other shuttle connections that we've proposed um, that will add um, opportunities for people to group together and ride uh, to South Station or the Seaport uh, or to North Station, obviously, which then connects them into the T system in, in a variety of different manners to Red Line, Green, green Line, you know, Blue Line. Um, this just gives you a sense of what we did for a study. We were asked by the, MB, uh, by the uh, MassDOT people to conduct two studies. One is a, what's called the CTPS uh, regional model that is kind of a car-centric model. Obviously, we don't really, we, we think that at the end of the day, people are going to be more encouraged to take the blue line. So we did more of a TOD parameter study to be sure that we study the worst of the potential for, for car outcome and the worst of the potential for uh, potential burden on the blue line. So to make sure that we're, we're being careful that we end up studying things appropriately. So these are the two studies that we filed um, you know, throughout that, um, uh, through the, the document that I described to you from two Mondays ago. Here's, this is a blue line capacity slide. So just to give you a sense of it, these green lines here are what are called the policy capacity um, uh, uh, slides. So in 2038, assuming the CTPS model, which is a little bit more of the car-centric model, essentially what ends up happening is this um, orange piece here, the orange tips on the top of these, these are the riders that come from our site, okay? All these other riders are from around the region and, and kind of where they are. But as you can see, this is the inbound capacity in 2038. Um, so at our full build out, so I hope to be with you in 2038. Um, but at our full build out, um, what you can see is we're under policy capacity here throughout the, the morning. It gets a little above at 9.30 or 10 o'clock when the T today runs fewer trains during that period of time. But one thing to just note is the blue line is an unusual line in that the T owns 14 blue line train sets. Uh, they only run 12 blue line train sets a day, uh, so they hold two in reserve, which is highly unusual. The red line, the green line, the orange line, they throw everything they have but the kitchen sink in the morning to get people to and from work, and still those trains are packed. There's no backup trains on any of those lines. So the blue line is very unusual. So we stuck to the, you know, the current plan, which is they'll hold two trains in reserve, but obviously they can put those two trains into service and increase this, this policy capacity throughout. And then obviously, uh, you know, you see it a little bit later. This is outbound on the CTPS in 2038. Um, again, these orange tips are our piece. You can see uh, these are, you know, coming back our, um, uh, the other way. Um, as I said, you know, as we add office piece, uh, we're, we're kind of creating a little bit uh, a better usage of the blue line in both directions. Now, this kind of shows the TOD piece. So here we studied, okay, assuming fewer car, uh, cars on the road and more riders on the blue line, uh, we wanted to make sure that we're still okay. And generally, you can see we're under the, the existing policy capacity. And then this is kind of uh, policy capacity potential. So these are, uh, these are essentially adding additional signals within the blue line tunnel, kind of moving uh, trains at a faster pace um, right behind each other. Certainly, you know, it would add the two additional trains in, in backup here to, to get that going. So these are, this is basically saying not extraordinary investments by the MBTA, which we think are all warranted, but these are not extraordinary uh, uh, investments. You're still getting through under policy capacity here all the way through to 2038. And this is outbound, same, same thing as you can see. Um, this just shows you, we studied all of the, the station uh, existing conditions to be sure that with this increased capacity, can the stations and the, uh, the platforms manage all these people? And, and the answer was yes. This is a, a slide that shows you the 53 intersections. This is a hard one to, to, uh, to actually fully review, but these are the intersections that we studied around the area. Obviously, some pretty far afield, but we recognize the, the theme for all this, I should say, is you, know, you all live here and you all know these um, uh, as well as anybody. There's, there's been a lack of investment, we think, in this transportation corridor for decades. So we think we can be part of a, a group of people together with you to make these transportation improvements, some of which might be done by the state, some of which probably should have been done by the state, frankly, um, but we can certainly be the catalyst to ensure that they happen now. Um, and so studying these intersections has, has helped us define these. These are road safety audit study areas. So these are, these are intersections in which there are uh, accidents that have caused you know, uh, uh, you know, some injury. So we essentially go through uh, these intersections to go through a plan to improve the safety at these intersections as well. And this just gives you a sense of, so $50 million of offsite traffic mitigation, 
the key elements, and I think I'm going to show you some slides on this, we're going to uh, add a lane of traffic on Route 1A on both sides. So 1A today is two lanes each way. We're going to uh, shrink the, the median and add a lane of traffic on both sides, so it will now be three lanes uh, each way, which should uh, improve the queuing. We're going to change the, the left-hand turn at, at um, Boardman Street here to make that work more efficiently, efficiently, particularly for the trucks that are trying to get off there and head toward Massport. We're going to make improvements here on Winthrop Ave, uh, particularly from uh, 1A all the way over to Donnelly Square or to uh, Bennington Street. Uh, we're going to talk about how those pieces happen, you know, all the way through uh, the Winthrop Ave corridor as well. So this shows you 1A. <clears throat> so essentially, this is hard to see, but basically we'll, we're going to do a comprehensive total reconstruction of Route 1A. First time it's happened in decades. Um, uh, from, uh, you know, um, basically Winthrop Avenue all the way down to uh, 205 McClellan Highway. Add a third lane, as I said, in each direction. So it'll increase capacity on this road from 2,100 vehicles to about 3,300 vehicles in each direction. Um, a big difference in, in people's lives as we go through. We'll have new bus pullouts on the Suffolk Down site. We'll fully signalize our, our intersection here that will become a totally different intersection and will become kind of the main entrance uh, to our site uh, here at the Suffolk Down site. Uh, and we'll, you know, add new shoulders for bicycles and the like. This just gives you a little bit more detail on, on Winthrop Ave and kind of how uh, we'll go through. Again, these are hard slides to see, I think, from your, 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 uh, your seat. Happy to go through these in more detail uh, with people. But essentially, this is uh, the detail from 1A here all the way down to, uh, to Beachmont Station on this side uh, with changes and widenings. Uh, particularly, uh, the, the, the key thing is, you know, making the intersection from North Shore Ave, um, you know, all the way down to Revere Beach Parkway, make this, this stretch work more efficiently between our site and that existing group of uh, roads. This just shows you, these are all the, the list of mitigations. These are all the, the basic plans that we've shown from Route 1A all the way down to Route 60 to Breed Street at Route 60, Neptune Road at Saratoga. These are, it's been a detailed effort to go through it all. I'm ha again, happy to, I don't want to bog everybody down, but happy to answer questions on some of those pieces. Let me do a little bit on environmental resiliency and we're coming to the end here, folks. Um, so the park uh, system that I described for you Part of the, the method to the creation of our park system is there will be occasions of flooding between now and 2070, right? So we know our world is changing. We know that, uh, that climate change is causing there to be more storms. We certainly understand that the ocean is going to rise and that there will be more influx of ocean water, more rainwater. And so we need to figure out ways to manage it. So essentially, in creating the park system, we're creating a system that for 99% of the time will be parks. But during the storms that will happen that small percentage of time between now and 2070, we need to be prepared to manage the water. There is no uh, stormwater system that exists on this site today. So we'll build a whole new stormwater system, be able to hold during the flood events, hold water on site, and then allow the water to, as the storm subsides, allow the water to, uh, to make its way off site. So we're being responsible neighbors by managing the water well, and we're keeping our built environment, our roads and our buildings, up out of the flooding uh, as we go through. So essentially what ends up happening is we change the grade of, of portions of the site and hold water on our site in a responsible manner to move it off site when the storm subsides. So this is the everyday condition you know, into the future. These are, this is the, the uh, small uh, pond that's in the middle of the, uh, uh, the infield. This is Sales Creek. These are other marshland uh, and water uh, pieces that are on the edges of the site. This shows you the estimated two-year storm event. So this is kind of the the regular two-year storm that's projected between now and 2070. You can see that we use our park system to hold water. We also create some subsurface uh, uh, infiltration systems. So these are essentially huge tanks that will build below that central uh, park system there. Um, then this is a 10-year storm event. Again, still managing the water and holding it on site. Uh, and then it, it goes off uh, site at the end of the storm event. Here's the 100-year storm. So this is Superstorm Sandy or, you know, something like that. Pick your, pick your uh, terrible storm. Uh, but we can still, again, manage the water on site uh, and move it off site. I would say, I don't think we put this slide in. I'm going to come back to this in one second. So this shows you, this is our, our outdoor performance theater. So as I said, you know, 99% of the time, we want this to be a great place for people to gather, but it also will hold water. So it'll hold water in the storm event. You know, hopefully there'll only, only be one of these between now and 2070. Um, maybe there's two but uh, it'll hold water and then uh, manage the water offsite from there. These are the points of entry. I would just add, I forget if we put something in here. Yeah, so this is, this, this just shows you, here's, here's the, the areas where we have pledged to make improvements from 
Uh, new tide gate uh, for upstream protection here uh, at, uh, at the Belle Isle Inlet. Uh, upgrading of the DCR pump station, all those pieces. Additional lowering of grading in these areas to hold water, all those stuff. The one thing I would add, yeah, the good. I'm glad uh, Doug put this in or, or Kate put this in. One thing we're also suggesting is, you know, we'd like to make a connection all the way from Maverick Square all the way down to, I'm sorry, is there a question? Bobby, you, no. Yeah, Raphael actually has okay. a question. Yep. Raphael, just introduce yourself so everybody. I'm Raphael Maris, normally a resident of Beachmont and the executive director of the Neighborhood Developers. I just had a quick question. Earlier this year, we had flooding at the Beachmont station, and I was wondering how your efforts are going to impact um, the station. So this, that's exactly why I put the slide up. So, so we, um, um, one of the things we're thinking about, and this, there are, there are a variety of constituencies that care deeply, right, about around Bell Isle Marsh and this whole piece. But we recognize that this is a major inflow, potentially, of water. And we, we know, as you do, how quickly this um, parking lot by the school floods, right? So one of the things that we've talked about since the very beginning is it would be great if we could make a connection from Maverick Square <clears throat> to the south uh, by bike or pedestrian or whatever, um, all the way up to Revere Beach. So we've been working carefully to make the connection from, particularly from the East Boston Greenway, which is a, an op a piece of open space that you may know where the East, new East Boston Library is and all those things. So to make that connection all the way through uh, past our site, even using our site if it works, uh, but past our site up to, uh, to Revere Beach. So the one thing that's been clear in that effort is it's hard here, even though we'd love to have that bike uh, path come on our site, because of the blue line here, it's hard to kind of make this change. So we focused on the fact that that bike lane probably comes here, um, near the, you know, the entrance to Belle Isle Marsh. So then we kind of said to ourselves, all right, the best way to protect the Beachmont neighborhood, Beachmont Station, uh, and you know, kind of generally in here is perhaps there's a berm that gets built here. It's pretty logical, it's pretty, it's just, it's the right thing to do. So if we can combine the construction of a bike lane here with a berm here, that's, that we think would go a long way toward protecting the Beachmont neighborhood, particularly this section of the Beachmont neighborhood from, from future flooding. So again, we, you know, we surface that as, as an idea that's not something, yet, that, that's gonna require a lot of work with, particularly the people who care deeply about Beachmont uh, uh, Marsh too. Yes. And, and Tom, and the berm, <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up because again, that's one of the things when we were kicking around the ideas about the flooding and, and Bennington Street and all of that stuff. And, and what, what's been proposed is that, that berm actually kind of encircle Fredericks Park, that green space, and then come out all along the creek to really protect all of the Beach Bond neighborhood going down to the ocean. And I know that's a long-term project, but um, that's probably worth expanding upon that idea to provide better protection. We'd be happy to lead that, you know, conversation or kick that conversation off. It probably happens in phases. You know, there are, I mean, there's all the constituents all along here, you know, who, some of whom may have different opinions, right? So there's a whole long public engagement process <clears throat> that's not directly related to us, but it is something we're happy to kick off and, and kind of help generate, you know. Okay, any other questions on that? Um, uh, obviously, the other, you know, the other piece of this is all the buildings that we'll uh, build will be LEED certifiable. Uh, you know, just about all the buildings will have uh, solar panels on top of them. We're working carefully on uh, making sure that the, 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 the city of Boston's 2050 carbon neutrality goal, you know, will be our, our goal as well. Um, you know, we, we're, we're working very carefully. Everybody who's in our business, from architects to developers to whomever, is totally focused on building sustainable buildings in the long term, and that's a key, a central part of who we are. Phasing. I think I'm coming to the end here. Phasing. So this just gives you a sense of, of where we are. Our first phase is, is here at Beachmont Station. And this phase includes uh, the innovation center that I described for you here, the hotel uh, here, the retail on the base of, of all these pieces, including the innovation center and these uh, residential buildings. And then these are mixed-use residential buildings with uh, retail on the first floor. So this is the first phase. So essentially, R1, which is the Innovation Center, 35,000 square feet, about 20,000 square feet of innovation, which is really office space related to innovation uh, companies. Uh, retail, uh, about 15,000 square feet there, which is a significant amount of retail. That's at least two or three restaurants, believe me, good-sized restaurants. The hotel, about 140,000 square feet of hotel. So call that, you know, 
uh, call that 150 to 175 keys or rooms uh, for a hotel on that. Uh, in the retail, about 30,000 square feet of retail. So again, a significant amount of retail for that one. Uh, then we've got residential with retail here, R3, uh, which is here, and then R5, uh, which is here. R just stands for Revere. By the way, we have a, we have a big site, so B for Boston, R for Revere, just, just so you know. Uh, and then R9 here is residential here at, at this uh, piece of it. So again, about 140,000 square feet of hotel, about 20,000 square feet of innovation space, retail about 97,000 square feet, almost 100,000 square feet of retail that you know, is neighborhood retail in the first phase. That's a key uh, piece for us that we want to get right. Uh, so the total non-residential is about 257,000 square feet, and then the residential is about a million one six three um, in that first phase. Okay. Um, I mean, in the in, uh, in the non-residential, you mean, or in the oh, in this one here, it might be about a thousand units, something like that. Okay. Uh, phase two in Revere. So here in phase two, we've included. Um, a good size uh, office building. So that building at uh, at R four, I think it is, right here we are. Commercial uh, is about a half a million square feet of, of commercial office space uh, with retail about thirty four thousand square feet. So that's that's a big office building, um, and we want that to be successful. So we'll be out there right away, uh, beginning uh, you know as soon as possible, trying to uh, you know uh, get a tenant for that building to get that going. And then um, another uh, two resident, uh, three residential buildings, one here with retail, and these two smaller ones here. But then in addition to that, we complete all the open space here through Sales Creek uh, and the um, uh, outdoor theater that I described for you as well. Okay, so that's phase two. Phase three, now we're deeper into office. We've set the table here to make it a, a great place to live. And so now we're deeper uh, into uh, commercial and office. Uh, here at R7, that's a big building. Uh, three quarters of a million square feet of, of office, um, then residential about another 346 uh, here, uh, and then this commercial building is about 350,000 square feet uh, in Revere. So now we're getting close to the 50-50 piece, with the last uh, phase being these are commercial office buildings here uh, and here, again really good size ones, so that at the end of the, the phasing then we get to the 50% uh, commercial and 50% residential. Okay. So this gives you, this is a slide that just shows you all those phases all together. One R, remember, is Revere. This is the phasing generally. The hope generally for us, this is a very big site for us to, to build. So the hope, or the basic plan for us is to build a phase and then build another phase and go back. So year by year, kind of go back and forth between the blue line stations. Um, I could easily envision, by the way, one R and then two R right in a row in Revere. Um, just you know, given the proximity of the station, if we get that first plaza right, you know, I could easily see us doing these first two phases first before we even begin a first phase in Boston. If you just think about it, the reason we like this phase first is because, you know, this is a little bit more of a permeable part of the site. Um, and, uh, and this, you know, because it's a little bit more hemmed in, it's not quite as permeable, I guess is what I would say. So, you know, generally we, we're going to bank a lot on the success of this first phase. We want this to be successful in that first phase. That's our, that's our first piece. Generally, I think just quickly, summer benefits. I think I went through a lot of this uh, in terms of on-site and off-site improvements and street improvements and things like that. I don't want to hold people up and repeat some of these things. Parks, the permanent, oh, it's the job piece. Let me just do this. About 15,000 new permanent jobs in Revere, about 6,900 Revere construction jobs. Obviously, we're we want to work closely with the mayor's team to make sure that we connect Revere residents to jobs on our site. Uh, so we've talked a lot about that within the DAG to, to add those pieces. Um, and thank you. So that's us. Happy to answer more questions. Dan, do you want to just identify yourself? No, you don't. <laughs> oh, it's better. You got to get up. Uh, Dan McGuire, Beach Point resident. As a true transit oriented development, it's only good if the residents use transit. Mm. So in that line of thought, I was sitting here thinking, can you or would you lobby um, the T to get discounted rates as a Charlie Card member or make a prerequisite to renting or owning in the development a discounted Charlie Card, a, an incentive beyond just living right at the front door, mm -hmm. uh, a monetary incentive to renting or owning? Um. I don't, I think, I'm just going to be really direct, Danny. I, I think, Thanks. I think the, um, the T will, we'll have any conversation with anybody, but I think the T is going to anticipate 
full pay Charlie cards up and down the system. You know, I, I think they're going to be they're going to be nervous about setting that precedent for any particular site. Um, I do envision though, when we bring in these office tenants, I do envision the office tenants subsidizing their employees with Charlie cards. It's, it makes a lot of sense for that, and and I think we'd like to be part of that. I would bet. You know, making the final deal with these people, they'll probably look at us to help with that. I, mean, I you know, again, I don't know this to be the case, but I would think that'd be part of the the list of things that they'll want us to do to kind of make that work. In terms of the residential piece, I think this is going to be a popular place for people, just given you know how close the blue line is and how good the blue line is. So I I think people are going to be incur they're going to want to take the blue line in any event, you know, to go to wherever they're going to go. We'll monitor it though to be careful to be sure that you know we're creating the right encouragement. I'm happy to have that conversation with the T. I just, you know how it is. I mean, they're scratching for any piece of revenue they can. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, they're trying to get whatever they can for you know for revenue. Tom, um, one of the things that came clear during our meetings, and and when you think about projects this size, you know, as I've mentioned before, two things people think about in terms of residential, impact on traffic, impact on schools. Um, you educated me about the impact of residential versus commercial. I think you, it would be good to address that, but also address the impact on schools where your numbers came from, because I just recently saw those, because I think they're worth talking about. Sure, sure. Um, so the first, you know, what we, what we talked about um, in terms of traffic, um, the way we've, you know, the, part of the reason why residential has been, um, uh, you know, uh, more closely considered in some instances, I guess I would say, is in part because the impact on traffic for residential is less than the impact on traffic for commercial. You know, if you just think about the nature of building office buildings here, we're going to draw people from all around the, the region. You know, we want them to take the blue line here, um, and we want them to take rapid transit, but a lot of the people who will take those jobs, if they're commuting from the South Shore, if they're commuting from the North Shore, will be at least tempted and will likely drive, right? So. So slightly more residential or an appropriate amount of residential lessens the impact on the roadways um, is kind of one piece that we talked about, as, as you noted. The other piece in terms of schools, so what we found here, particularly if we focus on the senior housing component and the apartment component, what we found is, you know, we won't be building three bedroom units um, uh, in the Revere side. So what we found is there's actually a, um, uh, uh, mostly a demographic that does not have children that will move here, either seniors or young people who do not yet have children. So when we did our study, you know, it was kind of we did an outside third party study that uh, kind of confirmed what we found in all of our different projects, which is the impact on the Revere Public Schools is minimal in terms of the number of children. I forget the numbers of 4.5, yeah, I think it's 4.5 a year, uh, that's right. We'd be more than happy, we've made that study public if people want that, we'd be more than happy to, to send that uh, to people as well. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name's Larry Smith. And I, I think I've heard that kind of comment about different developments in the past where there's going to be minimal, uh, minimal result in, in the schools, but it doesn't always seem to turn out to be that way. And I'd be curious if you could take a look at maybe some of the other projects that you've done where you've had maybe a similar study done beforehand and then go back now and take a look and see just what that turned out to be, the impact on the schools and if it turned out to be the number of children in the developments as you expected it to be because I've heard that, you know, with up at the quarry in, in, uh, in Revere up by the Malden line and it was expected that there wouldn't be too many families with the children to impact the schools, and I think it's been an impact. We, we did, we actually went back, and, and some, not to all of our different projects, but we, we do periodically go back and, and look at them. And what we found is actually the actual experience in terms of actual number of students is less than what we originally projected. We found like we were being more conservative. I don't know the Quarry project. I, we've heard that come up a number of different times, so I don't really know that one. In my experience, if I could make a suggestion, I, I think a lot of what ends up happening is the existing housing stock, Okay, of you know, of, of two, three, four bedroom homes, as those turn over, or, or those you know sometimes get acquired by investors, and perhaps they turn into rental properties or whatever those. That to me, when we study these things, that's a lot of where the the new kids are, are coming from in the system. I don't, I, I can't say that you know with confidence, just because I, I haven't done a broader you know we we haven't done a broader study to 
say this is exactly what's happening. Um, you know, but I, my suspicion is that that might be what's happening. In the I, I might say just for our own purposes, the city of Revere did do a study on exactly the situation you're talking about. And in the case of Overlook Ridge, which is the name of the quarry development, there were, I think, 39 students out of the entire Revere portion of that population. We also checked all of the new development, uh, Romney Flats, uh, et cetera. The cost-benefit analysis was that those developments contributed about $7 million to the property tax base, which is about 10%, and they contributed about less than 3% to the schools. So it's not zero, but it's still disproportionate. It does change over time, as you suggest, uh, but apparently not so dramatically that it would be a significant problem. So we do track that, and we're sharing that information with them as well. Question over here, sir. Uh, Sorry, I thought this was all our team. I turned my back to you the whole time. I apologize. Sorry. Uh, David Gregory, a Beachmont resident. Um, you skipped quite briefly over um, your off-site shuttle buses, mm -hmm. um, which I thought, which I hadn't heard of before. Um, so, two questions arising from that: I mean, how committed are you to that, and will there be any link to prioritization in traffic? Because obviously, people are only going to take them if they're not mm -hmm. sitting behind everybody else. Yeah, the prioritization in traffic was a topic we just raised this actually with the MassDOT senior staff and. Um, um, oops, um, we just raised that topic with the MassDOT senior staff and um, first of all I, I would say the MassDOT senior staff is very focused on data and research and you know it's actually kind of heartening when you, the more time you spend with them but they're reluctant to prioritize buses or vans over existing traffic at least today um, so we're raising this topic with them to try and understand why and whether we'll go deeper into a research, you know, mode with them. Um, but for today, MassDOT is reluctant to, pray, you know, to create a dedicated lane for buses or vans, you know, that that sort of thing. Um, that's the feedback that we got as of this week, you know, from that. But for us, we're absolutely committed to these these shuttles. I mean, part of what we're trying to do here is we're trying to we're trying to create a su successful community. So we're ready to make the investment. You know, we 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 uh, we actually did an updated meeting today with our investment group and talk through the full components of the $300 million or so that we need to invest, including the cost of these shuttles. And we're all on board, you know, to do it. Um, it's a big site. It requires a big investment. We went, went into it with our eyes wide open. We knew uh, that we were going to have to make this investment. I, I should add, I should have said this at the outset, too. We feel, you know, I, I've been doing this for 25 years. Members of our team have been doing it for a little bit longer. Doug Mans, who's my partner, has been doing it for probably 20 years. Um, we feel really fortunate that we have an investor group with us who wants to build this with us for the long term. In other words, we're, we're in this to build it over the next 20 years. I'm going to be doing this seriously until I'm 75 years old um, because that for us is a really amazing opportunity. So we're, we want this to be successful, which means we're committed. We, it won't be successful if people can't get to work. or if people, you know. So we're committed to these. This is a, this is a key part of what we want to do. There's another element of the shuttles which came up in the context of the DAG discussions, and that's whether or not they would have connections to local destinations in the Revere and East Boston neighborhood. And I think that's still under discussion, but it's certainly something we want to do to connect this development to the community and vice versa. And I, could I add one quick thing too, by the way? For these transportation improvements, the one likely thing that will happen is at the end of the MEPA process, so remember the state has an overall MEPA process, so our, our proposed transportation improvements, we'll, we're going to uh, do a, you know, kind of a more detailed working group with both the, the city of Revere as well as the city of Boston as well as MassDOT. And we'll do that over the next you know, number of months. And as we, we dive into the details of these kinds of improvements, those will then, to the extent that we all agree on them, those will then get memorialized in our MEPA certificate. So what will end up happening with a shuttle system like this, it'll say, you know, once you get to phase two or phase three or phase four, you must do the following things. Otherwise, we can't. We won't get permitted for those those phases. So, we will be locked in to to do this work. Uh, Laura Libby, um, I have two questions. The first one is you mentioned in the very beginning um, about North Point that you sold that off and somebody else is building it. So that raised a concern in my mind about you know you're talking a lot about long term with this project. Why is this different than that? Totally different capital structure. So when we bought that. 
in 2010. We bought it with a partner that has a different um, uh, horizon and a different objective with their capital. So they raised their money from outside third parties uh, in a fund, and they promised that those parties would get that money back within seven years of having raised it. So when we bought North Point, we knew we had a five-year horizon to implement the plan and go, but we knew we needed to return that capital to their investors. The ownership here, uh, f both for us and for that group, is a uh, w what we call in our business a high net worth family. So it's a U.S.-based family, based in you know they're in the U.S., not from around here, um, with multiple billions of dollars, and this is a long-term investment for them. They do not want to sell that. So that's why we feel so fortunate. So that's. The reason we're able to talk in this manner is because it is a long-term investment. We, we, you know, we have we have our own personal. We're not the O'Brien family. Trust me, is not very wealthy. But the, but when we do this work with these investors, they want us to put enough money in of our own capital to be sure that we're in pain if if it's not going right. So we so that we wake up every morning panicked, you know, about where we are. <laughs> but they are so they're the lion's share of the capital. But they're patient. They're long-term. It's a family that is a multi-generational. You know that has multi-generational kinds of investments like this. Thank you. And my second question is about the phasing. Um, you talked about phase one, and you talked about the road changes. Can you talk a little bit about when you're doing phase one? Uh, you know that roadway where the main entrance will be. I'm assuming that 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 some of that work is going to happen right away, but but maybe that's a bad assumption. Um, I mean the main entrance to the site. Um, so let me go back to let me see if I can use a better map here. Forget if I'm heading in the right direction. Well, earlier, yeah. Where am I going, Michael? Sorry. Here, if you help, let me find what kind of way back. Yeah. I'll use this one. Okay. So, so, so basically, this improvement. So, Michael, I might need you to give me a little hint. Um, yeah. What's that? You're thinking this entrance, right? The main entrance? Oh, Furlong Drive, you mean? Oh, oh, Winter Path, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so, you're, you're, so here's our phase one, you know, sort of generally here, right? So um, uh, certainly all the on-site, you know, road improvements, all those pieces we need to make. Um, Michael, could you remind me, what section of Winter are we doing in that phase one? Are we doing all the way down uh, here in that phase one? Show it. Just you point to it. Just, if you point to it, I'll describe it. Just show me. Michael Borowski is the project manager speaking now. Sorry. Yep. With the microphone. So the first phase will involve improvements all along with the path here, all the way down to you know past the, the current Tomasello uh, entrance, including you know new signalized um, uh, intersections here. The key thing I'd also want to mention, which this slide doesn't really show very well, uh, we also made a determination to move our buildings back onto our site. So in other words, to give more room here for this to be both a sidewalk and a cycle lane. So uh, to, actually with a line of street trees as well. So, so this will be cycle lane, sidewalk, and street trees all along here. So it's, so Winthrop is going to look more like a boulevard than it ever, you know, ever, excuse me, ever has. So that'll be uh, phase one. Yeah. I, I think another element to that Sorry. question, Tom, has to do with Tomasello Road and your plan to realign it. It might be worth yeah. describing that. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I, I should. Um, so the Tomasello uh, is here, you know, the existing Tomasello. The interaction between Tomasello and uh, North Shore Boulevard, uh, I'm sorry, do I have it? Yeah. North Shore Road, sorry, North Shore Road and um, uh, Revere Beach Parkway, that interaction doesn't really work well. We need to separate that a little bit. And this is kind of more in the VHB uh, realm. So uh, moving it down here helps us quite a bit. And so we'll uh, improve the signalization here, uh, add a lane both uh, coming in and going out as well. So it just makes that intersection work far better. Yes. Also, Billy in the back has something too. Council. Tom, I have, uh, I have a question. Uh, I represent, as a city councilor, I represent the uh, northeast section of, of the city, the Point, the Point of Pines, Oak Island, uh, and as a matter of fact, the area we're sitting in right now. And obviously, I hope this project will be a, a massive success. And considering this project in the uh, NECO 
property, which is another 50 acres of and Macca Wonderland and the Wonderland property. Uh, for these uh, projects to be a success, I'm sure there are going to be many upscale restaurants, many professional buildings where you'll be drawing employees from uh, all parts of the North Shore. Uh, what uh, considerations uh, are, be, are up, out there for uh, uh, decreasing the traffic coming from the North Shore as far down as Gloucester and Rockport and Salem and Lynn and Beverly? Uh, one of the things that I have often thought about, uh, which would also benefit your project, uh, would be a, uh, a commuter stop at the back of Wonderland with a direct walk over to the Wonderland station, uh, which would not only be able to take uh, people from the North Shore further down to your uh, project, uh, to the NECO project, uh, even to the airport. So uh, I'm wondering what consideration you, you have given this. I'm sorry. We were with the Secretary of Transportation just uh, the other day. And we raised that issue with her. So she she likes the idea. So so the idea, just for everybody in, in the audience to note, I'm trying to look for a map that might show it a little bit better. Council, actually, that might be a good one right there. Yeah, uh, maybe it's just off the map. So um, yeah, so, so so basically, just right, am I just off the map? The, the as the as the commuter rail kind of comes down this way, it takes a path, kind of comes this way, right, Councilor, so, sort of over over heading towards Chelsea. But it's close enough to where you are at Wonderland where we can have a really easy connection between the commuter rail and, and so that's part of what we've suggested um, uh, to her. And she likes that. She she wants those kinds of you know relatively inexpensive connections. So that's that's kind of one key thing on our, our list. The one thing I would just add though is which is the theme of all of our improvements is to try you know there's Revere is burdened by the regional traffic right and and the problem is when the regional traffic gets you know in this stretch here. The, the ways mechanisms and all the other pieces, they're causing people to look for the shortest route. So they're all getting off their, right, exactly. So the basic theme for us is to keep people on 1A as best we can or ease the inter, you know, interaction between 60 and 1A, make, keep people on 1A and keep the traffic out of neighborhood streets in Revere. That's, that's really what we're trying to do. So a lot of what we're about is not just this is kind of where it's a little bit frustrating. We're, we're, it's an honor for us to do these things. It's a little frustrating that we have to be the people to do it. We're, we're merely developers, I guess. But these are things that have not been addressed by the Commonwealth for a long time. So, but the idea is to keep people on 1A and keep them off of Revere Streets. And then we're not, we're not going to be perfect in that regard, but we're trying to encourage people to do that, which is why you know, this improvement on 1A is, is a key part of it. We've also proposed, this is kind of not part of our bailiwick, but but John really has an interesting fix for the interaction between the store drive ramp and uh, um, the, the off ramp, you know, two store drive from the tunnel, taking you up to store drive by the Longfellow Bridge that we think can really ease up some of that tunnel traffic. You know, all those things are things that we think are, are good regional fixes that aren't that difficult for the state to do. Uh, we're happy to be the catalyst, but that's the objective. And Tom, it's also worth noting that the interim step of a shuttle connection to the existing Chelsea commuter rail stop. Also is meant to attract that kind of traffic. Also on our list. Yeah. Bill Rogers, uh, I am, I'm a local uh, Beachmont resident, uh, longtime resident, a former mem member of the, of the highway department. You know, 1A, as you mentioned, Tom, I've been saying this for 30 years. I've taken 1A in my truck. Boston to build things. Um, I've taken I've taken one A in. I could not never understand why we didn't widen that way back when. I know why. The money went to bridges. It went to the the things that absolutely were catastrophically it, it, they needed it. Anyway, I applaud you very much for doing that. That's going to be a tremendous relief for everybody. And the second thing is, I lived in Reston, Virginia for six years. I, I lived and worked there. After I retired the first time, and uh, wonderful, same type of development. The school system had absolutely no burden at all. It was mostly young professionals. Uh, it was people that retired. It was the, the greatest place to live, except that they didn't have the ocean. 
if, if, Which if we that have. the ocean, I'd probably still be there. We have the ocean. Yeah, exactly. I, I appreciate that, Bill. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I um, you know, it's really, I, I have to give credit again to your friend, John Kennedy, right, who, you know, who's really been the ideas person behind this. I think, you know, this whole process around the transportation study is sort of, it felt like it freed up John and the team to um, think about the implementation of projects that folks, you know, professionals like yourself have long thought about. And again, that's kind of why I think we're sort of the catalyst to, you know, to cause. Yeah. Yep. Yep. We agree. We agree. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Amanda McGordy, I, I just had a question about the proposed um, suggestion for expanding 1A. Um, so or, where I live, I would essentially come up 1A from Boston and get off right onto Winthrop Street. But it seems like it bottlenecks right at that ramp that goes over Winthrop Street. So what potential impacts are created if you're expanding 1A to be three lanes instead of two, and it's bottlenecking into a two ramp? A two-lane ramp, where, so I'm gonna, which is then going to merge into. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call in the the right-hand relief pitcher on his way to the Hall of Fame, <laughs> to uh, to give me a little. <laughs> That's why I give you a microphone. Do you want that? Uh, no, I'm all set up. Um, the idea of opening up the three lanes is to get traffic that wants to. Well, providing three lanes northbound at night is the critical component. Providing three lanes inbound in the morning is the critical component. Um, we have to start and end that third lane someplace. So on the inbound side, the southbound side, the third lane starts at Winthrop Avenue. So as you get on it from Winthrop Avenue today, you have a stop sign or a yield sign where you meet the, the uh, traffic that's already on Route 1A. That's, that goes away. That's where the third lane inbound starts. So that's the relief that we get, and it continues down almost to the Marriott Courtyard, where it goes back to two lanes, and we get into the next viaduct. Outbound at night, yeah, the one issue that we're gonna really be working with is how much traffic are we delivering down to, beyond Furlong Street, north of Furlong Street? The traffic getting off from making a U-turn to Winthrop Avenue is probably only 500 vehicles of the 3,300 vehicles that we can have in the system. But we think by that time, the amount of traffic that is actually working itself beyond the site is not gonna be as great as that 3,300 per hour that we're designing for. So yes, we're gonna have an impact, still have an impact where we're going over the two lanes over Winthrop Avenue. But part of that, or a lot of that's caused by Bell Circle and the backup that's coming down from Bell Circle. So we're totally revamping Bell Circle also to increase or to, to try to reduce that delay and that backup and get it up onto Route 60 quicker or get it onto Route 1A quicker. And 1A and Route 60 can both handle it at this point because there's some other changes we're making down at Revere Street. So it's the idea of looking at the system in whole, understanding that it is not ever going to be perfect because no matter what we do to solve one problem, it moves it someplace else but we're just trying to get it dispersed enough so that the development itself causes no impact beyond the front doors of the project. Um, and you know, then work with the state. We're gonna be monitoring what's going on on this site for 20 years. Um, there's some talk about what can we build after the fact. And uh, so it's gonna be managed over the long term. This is Rafael Maris again. Um, did you consider in your traffic analysis induced demand the concept that when you widen um, or when you increase traffic capacity on a road that you actually pull in more traffic? Um, the local example of that may be the Ted Williams Tunnel when it opened up 15 plus years ago. Um, you, for a number of years you could just drive through it and there would never be any traffic, no problem whatsoever. You tried to do that today, that's just unfortunately not the case anymore. Didn't last long, yeah. And okay. because people figure it out that that's the better way to go, Waze will probably uh, make that process even faster than it was 15 years ago. So my fear is that you increase the capacity on 1A and the only thing that happens is that we have more cars sitting in traffic there than we had before. Kimbrell. Um, yes, that's one of the concerns. I think we looked at a series of different alternatives for the, the Route 1A corridor, and um, 
I will simply go through my, my real quick speech. Um, five years ago, DOT wanted an overpass at Bourbon Street. And I argued, and I argued, and I continue to argue that why do you want an overpass? When you got a bottleneck at the north and a bottleneck at the south, you just deliver traffic quicker. And you never want to evacuate. You know, when it comes to evacuation planning, something happens in Boston, you want to evacuate from the city. You never want to evacuate to the city. So the overpass, whatever we can do with surface alternatives, the overpass isn't going to be part of it. Um, the Ted Williams Tunnel, the Sumner Tunnel are always going to be bottlenecks. We're adding more traffic down into the system, but we're still trying to alleviate problems. And there is a major user between this site and the tunnels, and that's the airport. So we're going to deliver more traffic to the airport, even though we're going to deliver more traffic down to the tunnels. <clears throat> we're tittered around about this. Let's see, we probably need a third, a fourth harbor crossing now. We better start planning for it so in 30 years it might get built. I'm sorry, Secretary. Don't delete that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that it's always a problem. If you build it, they will come. The capacity that we're going to build, we're planning on this project. The, what we're building will handle everything that we know about this project now, plus the project itself. Um, I'm sure that Waves is going to send people here. I'm sure that other um, in, in vehicle navigation things are going to send more traffic here, but I can't tell you what the future of traffic is going to be in 20 years if we do move toward autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles, or any other thing, how the system is going to work then. I was just going to add one quick thing, Raphael, which is, you know, the other basic proposal for us is constant traffic monitoring, you know, so so making adjustments over time, that's a that's a key part of what, you know, what we uh, expect will be part of our responsibility in the MEPA certificate as well. It should be on if you just... My name yeah. is Mary, and I live in Revere, and I'm a homeowner also in Revere. I have a few questions. Um, I wanted to know, was this meeting here tonight, was it advertised anywhere? Yes. Whereabouts? On this week's or in last week's? On the Reveal website? I'm just wondering because I was on the Reveal website today and I could not, I didn't see that on the main page. Whereabouts? I'm pretty good on the website. I'm pretty good on the website, I'll just tell you, I couldn't find it. It wasn't on the first page and I didn't see it anywhere and I searched and I didn't find anything come up. I think we also published um, a schedule of meetings some months ago, you know, so I, I think, yeah. Okay, well, okay. I missed it on the website and I didn't see it in the journal the last few weeks I read the journal. So anyway, by luck I found out about it because one of the councilmen spoke about it on the meeting last night. But not everyone watches the meeting, not everyone gets the advocate. I'll tell you, the advocate's hard to find in the city. It's not everywhere. You'll get it at New Deal, you might get it at City Hall, but you don't find it everywhere. Anyhow, I think the meeting should be advertised more, and I think it should be on the last, on the first page of the Revere City's website, if you really want to attract people's attention. I think there'll be a lot more people here. Not only the games tonight, but besides that, there would be other people if they knew about it, perhaps. Um, so I would like them advertising the meetings as many places as possible, especially on the front page of the um, city's website. I was at um, one other meeting, um, and I'm curious because when I hear tonight that you have 2860 units of housing in Revere. Total over, that's over a, a 15 to 20 year time to build all that out. Okay. And then 7,200 in East Boston. Approximately, Was yeah. that 4,000 in East Boston prior to, I thought I heard a 4,000 number back a few months back um, for East Boston. I don't remember 7,200. 
No, so Did there's that two. There's two. Well, there's Did two. There's two proposals um, that affect more Boston than they do Revere. So, the one proposal is what I would say is more office space. Okay, and has to do with the Amazon uh, proposal that was made uh, some months back. So Amazon, when they came to town, said that they would like eight million square feet of commercial office space. And there's you know, one site in which that could be offered on a campus basis, and that's us. So that proposal with 8 million square feet reduced the number of housing units in, in Boston. But the Amazon thing is, while important, we haven't heard much from Amazon. So the base proposal is uh, we kind of revert back to 5.5 uh, million square feet total across the site. So uh, half of that 5.5 million square feet approximately is in Revere, and half of it is in, is in Boston. But that also means, though, is in Boston because there's more land area in Boston. So that means that the residential count in Boston goes up to the approximately 7,000 units or so. Uh -huh. And the city of Boston's objective is more residential than it is commercial. Okay. So it seems like that number did change from a meeting. No, we we have not changed that. Okay. Uh, in we've not changed that in. I, I forget, when we set the program over a year ago, I, we've not changed that. Okay. So I have. Um, 2860 units in Revere and 7200 units in East Boston. Is that correct at this point? Sounds right. Okay, yep. thank you. Um, Over 20 years, if I could just yeah. point that out. So right. it won't be tomorrow. It's going to take 20 years to happen. Thank you. Um, now, 10% will be senior housing. Is yes. that 10% of the 2860? 10% of the 2860 and 10% of the 7200, yes. Okay, so Revere will get. 10% of the 2860 as senior housing? Yes, Okay. correct. I don't know if there's any talk for veterans housing, but we can certainly use that also. Yeah, we'd, we'd be more than open to that. I, I know okay. Council Member Selsky has just- and veterans are a different class, a special class, to be honest. Yeah, and we agree. I, I think both of them can use some help. Our taxes are very high in Revere, our residential taxes are high, and- um, I could point out for that the point. The veterans as well as the seniors could use some help with that. Yeah, we agree. So we'd be more than happy to explore veterans. If I could just put on the tax issue, if I may, ma'am, just for a second. The um, part of the effort here, part of the reason why the, the, the taxes are high is there's not much of a commercial tax base in Revere. Just hasn't been, right, for decades. So the question is, okay, how do you, how do you, how do you attract commercial, how do you get office buildings to be built? You can pound the table all you want. You can scream and yell and say, we want more office buildings. But I'm in this business, and, and I'm just telling you, we're not going to get an office tenant here. We're not, okay? Until we make a place, a campus, in which the kinds of people who those office tenants want to employ are living and enjoying and going to restaurants. So our proposal on the 2,400 or so units, our proposal is we need to make it a great place to live with restaurants and the like, make it a, a, set the table for that, and then we can get an Amazon-like company. That's our thing. Once we do that, we think we're going to add a significant amount. I think I put a $30 million net number up there, which is, I think, more than double the existing tax base. I don't know what that does. I'm not a tax expert, so I don't know what that does for your tax rate long term. But it certainly will make an impact on what the city reveres tax rates are for homeowners. I just know that seniors and veterans, it's a little hard for them. Totally agree. I totally agree. It's unfair. Yeah, I agree. But it's hard. But, you know, in, in deference to the elected officials, people are doing the best they can with the cards they're dealt, and you need to build more commercial office space. We're going to be part of that. We will absolutely be part of that. It's not tomorrow, but we're going to work on it, and we're going to make it happen. Okay. And um, also, um, as far as the East Boston is going to be East Boston, Revere will be Revere. So as far as... You have, um, I believe, one road leading out of that um, development into Revere. No. Am I wrong? Yeah, let me go back. I thought that all exits were leading out no. from Revere. No, and, and I know this is an issue in which to. there's been some confusion, so let me see if I can clear it up really quickly, see if I can get to them. I was them. told that in the last meeting I was, I was at that no. um, there will be no exits into East Boston. Well, no, that's not correct. Um, okay. The the main exit they did state it on the council meeting last night also so yeah maybe so everyone's misinformed or something's changed well i think there's been some rumors out there that you know that that so I, can i just can i yes. clarify so the main entrance to the site by vehicles is here on 1a this is in east boston right 
So you drive by this you know, all the time. This is the main entrance to Suffolk Downs. It's not a fully signalized intersection today, so it's not possible for people to come out of Suffolk Downs and make a left turn you know, and go into the city. People do it, obviously. They're not supposed to. It's illegal. It's very dangerous. They take their life in their hands when they do it, but, but some people do do it, right? So um, the big, one of the big transportation changes, one of the big moves for us is to fully signalize this so that people coming out of the site will make a left and people coming into the site can more easily make a right into the site. That's in addition, Boston. Yes. In addition to that, we want people coming down 1A to be encouraged to make a left into the site coming from the north as well. So we anticipate this to be our main entrance and exit into the site. That's the, that's the key piece. And I know there, I don't know why, but there, there are people who continue to say, no, this is, but this is the case. This is what we're doing. This is one of our first and big moves. And we and anticipate the that'll be the main. Entrances and exits are where? So, so this will be the main, if you're asking East Boston or, or Revere, I'm sorry. Well, both. I so uh, the main entrance and exit in East Boston is here, which will continue to be, we think the main entrance and exit for the site. The um, entrance and exits for, um, uh, for Revere will take um, Thomas Ello Drive, as I said, we kind of relocate it here. So it's the same, uh, same drive, essentially. We relocate it uh, a little bit further south this way. We do introduce new streets here off of uh, Winthrop Ave. These are not, though, I don't anticipate being the main entrance or exits. They essentially kind of create neighborhood streets inside the, the site, but the main entrance and exit is here on, in East Boston. I would assume that Thomasello Drive will get you know, uh, activity as well, which is also in Revere, um, but they're not new in Revere, and nor is anything being shut down in East Boston either. So I see, it, am I getting this straight? There is one entrance and exit in East Boston and one in Revere. Well, That's what it looks like from what you just told me. Yeah, I would say this is the main one in Revere, but to be honest, these are two other roads here on Winthrop Ave. Again, I don't see these as being main entrance or exits on Winthrop Ave. We're trying to create neighborhood streets any here. any entrance and exits is what I'm saying. Yeah. Where are they? That's all. I'm pointing to them right here. So this is Tomasello, and these are two smaller streets here. See this right here? Yeah. And here. Okay, so we have three. It looks like three in Revere and one in East Boston. Yeah, I guess that would be correct. Oh, I'm sorry, Furlong Drive, I apologize. Yeah, I apologize. Furlong, Furlong Drive comes here, yeah, to 1A. That's, and that's Furlong going Drive. into where? East Boston or Revere? This is in Revere. This is an existing exit and entrance today. So, so today, this is the target and the stop and shop here. Right. And this is uh, Furlong Drive uh, here on this I spot. I see that, okay. So, so, so if I were to add it up. There are three exits in Revere, and then the Tomasello Drive. Well, could I be clear on it? So if, you, if you're saying, what's the difference from today to tomorrow, okay? Here's what I would say. First, this today is not an exit in East Boston, because you cannot come out and make a left, right? So we're making it an exit today. So right. we're what adding- What will we end up with? That's what I'm trying so to So we're gonna at. add an exit in, re, in what I would say in East Boston, okay? But this becomes a main and signalized intersection, and we'll really, probably manage most of the transportation, vehicle tra transportation in and out of the site, okay? Um, Furlong Drive, which is here, is an existing entrance and exit in Revere. Thomasello uh, uh, Drive here, which is an existing, so, you know, same thing. To your point, I guess what you're saying is, we do add two streets here, but these are not main entrance or exits. These are really meant to be neighborhood streets for us. Um, and um, thank you. The, um, okay. the other question I had as far as the streets within the development, are they private streets? Public uh, streets. They use publicly, and who does the snow plowing? We do. And we do. repairs? We do. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, also, um, Route 1 and Route 16, I heard you mention, but I'm not sure something about some kind of upgrade or changes, what would that be that you would be doing there? John, do you want to do those Because changes? the traffic on Route 1, north and south, both day and night, is horrendous yeah. and leaks into all of the streets in West Revere, many of them, yes. you can't even move. 
I don't really have a, a slide for you, John. Maybe, okay. It used to be on Thursday and you? Friday, and now it's almost all week long that we have that huge amount of traffic. We're like a second Route 1 extension. So um, the, the Route 1 and 16 interchange um, is being looked at for improvements. Today, there is no ramp that serves the Route 1 southbound movement back onto 16 eastbound that comes around to Winthrop Avenue eventually. Um, that is a missing movement in the interchange, along with a missing movement from Route 16 westbound to Route 1 north, and Route, Route 1 north to Route 16 westbound. There are three movements that are not provided by that interchange that will be added as part of the project here. Um, the intent is to, and I think the city has given us a goal to use the regional network to the best of our ability without putting traffic on local streets. So we're looking at improvements that can be made that get us to that point, which is why we're talking about the improvements to Route 1A and the improvements, um, some improvements to Route 60 in the Bell Circle area and other things along the Route 1A corridor. Um, but those movements today are made by U-turns at other locations, like traffic coming down from on Route 1 southbound will either get off at Copeland Circle on the north and come down Route 60, or they'll come down to Route 16, go a few hundred feet to the west, make a U-turn at Webster and Garfield, and then come up the corridor to get to, um, to Winthrop Avenue. Um, that is creating an absolute mess in the morning in terms of the way everything has to work. So by us basically modifying the off-ramp and bringing it, bringing it down to a new traffic signal at Route 1 and 16, we're able to allow the movement directly rather than making the U-turn. That's the biggest change that we're talking about, about at Route 1, um, excuse me, at Route 1 and 16. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I also want to mention, yes. So to your, um, so Mary, just uh, to your uh, point on the um, on one A, I just wanted to point out. Um, so again, remember the objective for us is to. Um, I don't really have a good slide for this. The objective for us is to uh, keep people on one A. So to John's point, but I did want to just point out. See if I have. Uh, this is our one A, right? So, so the the key the key move for us on one A. This is the, the current entrance and exit for, uh, for Suffolk Downs today on 1A. So the key thing for us is to vastly expand this intersection and signalize it. So make it so that there's a light there, okay? So it's hard to make a comparison. This becomes way bigger than it is today. So it's hard to make a comparison between this and two other relatively small, you know, neighborhood street pieces. That's the point I was trying to make. To you. Okay, thank you. I, I do want people to um, to think about, I know we're talking a lot about 1A, Winthrop Ave, Beachmont, but the traffic is going to go north and south. And I want people to think about um, when you're on Route 1 at any old time of day, um, especially, you know, commuting times and on the weekends, it's not a pleasant experience anymore. There are going to be people who are going to want to drive up to Saugus to the mall or Peabody. And right now, you can hardly get onto Route 1 any weekend day. The traffic is crazy. People are shopping. They're going everywhere. So we just need to think about, you know, everyone would love to have another, you know, 9,000 people living here in the tax and get the money and... But don't forget, these other extended roads that are not right here in Beachmont are also affected. They're already affected greatly by a lot of the developments that have been built around here. And uh, traffic is very dangerous. You can't get on and off, and you're in a store on Route 1, you can't get out. It's, it's a bad situation. And coming back into Revere from shopping in Peabody or Saugus, you're taking the exit, um, you know, near the theater. How many times there's an accident at that circle every hour, every day, 
at Ru you know rush hour coming home. Um, the, I don't know. You can probably get a hold of the numbers from the state, but there's constant accidents by that circle, and not only that, coming off in West Revere off of Route One. It's a scary situation, no matter, because you're trying to get off. There's a small ramp. There's cars coming down Route 1, and if they don't know the area, someone's going to get hit in the back and killed because you can't get away from the ramp. You're stuck because everyone's coming up Salem Street. They're not stopping. They don't have a stop sign. They're flying into Malden. They're flying out of Malden, and the other people going up the ramp to try to get onto Route 1, and you're trying to get off of Route 1. That whole situation there is extremely dangerous right now. The cars don't even use a blinker if they're going up to try to get onto Route 1 South. And you're waiting to get off of Route 1. So I will let you go, but I just want you to know our roads are getting much more dangerous with all this heavy traffic. Something to think about. People who live here, and I'm not sure how many... Um, people are residents, but the other thing I want to mention real quick is that the blue line has a lot of major problems in the winter with stall trains, etc. So plan on that too. That's not going to be a magic wand on that. No, I, Mary, I would, just, I would just sum up by saying, I mean, that's kind of why we did the extensive transportation uh, study work that we did. So we're aware of, you know, those pieces and those intersections. You know, I know you. I don't want to direct you to read that because it's it'll put you to sleep. Uh, you know, but we've we've done a lot of work already to correct some of those pieces, including some of the dangers. Yeah. Yeah. No, we agree. We agree. I, I might also add, Tom. Mary, uh, I would also add that uh, those are, as you know, are highways of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The city of Revere and other municipalities in the area have been advocating for the kinds of changes you're talking about to improve traffic flow. We are finally getting the attention of the Commonwealth precisely because of this project. So this is the kind of project that will contribute to the solution of problems that have been decades in the making, whether it's Route 1A or Route 1 or Winthrop Avenue. Okay. Understood. Thank you, Mary. Okay, we're coming very close to the end. and. Uh, Unless there are any other comments or questions, I would just make note of the fact that uh, this is, shall we say, the end of the beginning, by no means the end of the community participation process. The plan, uh, planned, uh, the PUD document will be submitted to the Revere City Council for review and approval. There will be a public hearing on November 5th and an informal presentation at the next council meeting at a committee of the whole before the meeting. So the process moves forward. Once the PUD is approved, there will be a continuing round of planning and participation with the community, including site plan review of every project that will be proposed for development here. So this is by no means the end, either of public comment or public participation. Having said that, unless there are any other comments or questions, I would again thank Tom for a very comprehensive presentation. For those who haven't heard it, 